I'm going to briefly discuss a tactic with you that is a preferred tactic of covert narcissists and is their use of something called the word salad. So let's get our definitions right. A covert narcissist as opposed to an overt narcissist. What's the difference? Well, the way that I've simplified it, and it's pretty gross oversimplification, but it really helps to get a foothold on quite a complicated psychiatric definition, is that the overt narcissist thinks that they're awesome and that they deserve special treatment. And generally speaking, the world agrees with them. They have enough people in external reality to say, yes, yes, you are awesome, we should all do what you say, that it satisfies them that they can afford to be overt. The covert narcissist thinks that they're amazing, but generally speaking, the world does not agree with them. So the world, their external reality, is not giving them feedback that yes, they're perfectly entitled to special treatment that the rules don't apply to them. What does this create in what is fundamentally a narcissist? There isn't really two distinct types Everybody with NPD kind of flows between these two states. So they actually function in reality in a more nuanced view as the, the two primary emotional supra states of the NPD, overt and covert. And they actually represent two separate strategies. The overt strategy would be, fuck you, I'm taking this because I'm amazing and you're my slave. The covert strategy would be, oh, please let me have that because I'm in a lot of pain and I need that more than you and I'm really a good person, but I'm the victim of some terrible tragedy. Give me the thing that I wanted the entire time. Weedle, weedle, weedle. How does this manifest more deeply than that? Well, it means that where the overt usually, I'm saying the overt and the covert, so they're two separate people, they're really not, they're two emotional super states, um, feels confident because they have a secure source of narcissistic supply. The covert is in a constant state of desperately and frantically trying to hold on fleeting little bits of pieces of contrived narcissistic supply that are always running out. So one is a more confident state, one is a deeply insecure state. One can afford to be brash and bold and arrogant with their agenda and say, yes, I want to take over the world. Why? Because I'm the superhero and I represent the super race and this is what we need. The other one would have to use much more sneaky means to get people to go along with that and they would have to lie their ass off in order to get there. Not that the overt narcissist doesn't lie, of course they do, but the covert narcissist cannot afford to be so direct because people don't really agree with their worldview. This disparity, if you imagine a narcissist who's constantly living in a state of provocation and narcissistic, uh, uh, of narcissistic um, injury, because of reality. So the covert narcissist wakes up, thinks I'm fucking amazing, and, and one of the first things they see after waking up, or they'll be reminded of, is something that reminds them that the world doesn't agree that they're amazing. They run the pattern, um, if only everyone would listen to me, uh, if only everybody would understand my misunderstood genius, and also I'm always the biggest victim in the room, no matter what happened to you, or no matter what awful thing I did to you, something that you did to me that you didn't realize you did to me made me feel even more emotionally worse. So we start to blur the boundaries, we, we get deep inside of moral relativism and start using, frequently covert narcissists will use a psychobabble, if they've learned it, to say, well, yes, I did kill all of your kittens, uh, an entire bag full of 20 of them I dumped into the river, but you don't understand that when you merely stroked one of, them, one of my kittens and showed it love, that fired off issues for me from childhood that made me feel infinitely worse than you felt when I drowned 20 of your kittens. Do you see? Frequently you will be accused by the covert narcissist of doing the very thing that they themselves have already done and worse. Now why? Because they live in this split state where they're constantly receiving narcissistic injury from the external environment, but also from themselves. The superego is always disappointed in them and always judging them for failing to receive the entitled treatment and the narcissistic supply they truly believe they deserve. So they're actually frequently not confident, brash and outgoing and having a good time. They're more frequently quite emotionally labile, quite insecure, the emotions go up and down, they're very insecure, they have to be more manipulative in order to get what they want. So manipulation is as, is as natural and normal for them as just breathing would be. And so use of techniques like the word salad become more frequent. If you're a true overt narcissist and you're in an overt narcissistic state and you're 
cornered, having lied about something, then the truly overt narcissist answer would be, yes, I lied, because you can't handle the truth. Yes, I lied, for the good of God, who I'm speaking to, for the good of the communist regime, for the good of the fascist regime, for the good of this, for the good of that, I lied. Or simply, yes, of course I lied, you idiot. Do you really think I would tell you the truth, you fucking worthless moron, you know, something, you know, countering it by, by just leaning into outrage. Instead of pulling out of the outrage and going, oh, I mustn't make this worse, just leaning in and going, yeah, of course I lied to you. You're an idiot. Why would I ever tell somebody like you the truth? And actually using that as a new opportunity to just rain down more uh, blows psychically onto your already shattered ego. That's the overt narcissist way. The covert is the junkie whose, whose suppliers are always going offline. You know those people you see, uh, these poor lost souls, uh, you, you see them around cities, they're into heroin, they're into crack, they're into whatever they're into, and they, they end up, all these addicts, once they become truly addicted, they end up with the same face, they end up with the same voice, the same speech patterns, and they all walk the same way. They're constantly, they're really, really fit, they're dying, but they're fit in the final months of their death because they're constantly walking around town at full pace with a really intense look on their face with their crackhead mates looking for the next hit. We can find a little bit of something over here and then we can find a little bit something over here, but we've got no money and we can't afford good gear. So we're always Jones in for the next fix. It's a much more, <coughs> excuse me, the evil is coming out of me. It's all psychic. Let the healing comments, <coughs> the darkness, the demons, they, um, <laughs> Well, they're, they're, the state that they're coming from, the core state that they're coming from is vulnerability. So when you say, this is why in the literature, especially in the older literature on narcissism, it wasn't called covert narcissism. In fact, it's really the internet that's calling it covert narcissism. The literature usually refers to a fragile narcissist or a vulnerable narcissist. A narcissist with a very fragile sense of self and a very fragile, therefore, grasp of reality and self-image and the vulnerable narcissist, where there will be many ostentatious displays of vulnerability. I'm such a victim, I'm so weak, I could never, I would never do that thing that I just completely, totally did. Um, you see this happening, it's playing out a lot as the uh, personality disorder is being disseminated through the culture. You will see this happening a lot. You'll find people, you've seen it in the news in the last six months, being caught red-handed doing something and then in their defense, either in, in court or during interviews saying, I would never do that. They just stole somebody else's chocolate milkshake, they guzzled it down, they still have the chocolate around their lips and dripping down their chin and they get caught and they're like, how do you defend yourself? And they go, what? Steal the chocolate milkshake? I would never do that. It's on your face right now. I would never steal somebody's chocolate milkshake, I'd never do that. There's uh, countless examples of, of people doing and saying this. What is this? It's a split. It's a splitting away from the shameful act. So the covert or fragile or vulnerable narcissist actually feels a ton of shame. They're constantly living in shame for their grandiose fantasies. They're like, I have these grandiose fantasies and then the inner critic the, or, or superego, depending on how you want to define it, the superego, the great judge, the inner critic inside of them, is inflamed and goes, you fool, you don't deserve those things. Look at yourself, you're so blah, 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 blah. And then their state goes down and they feel like shit. So they're constantly doing this. This is why some people, some researchers have said when you're looking at the clustering for the traits that we would test for that would define borderline personality disorder, oops a daisy, it looks like they're right inside there for vulnerable narcissism. I'm not going to get into the whole thing of people who've been diagnosed as, as borderline personality disorder when really what they have is just CPTSD. My um, personal way of, of, of sorting that one is to say, look, if you're not exploitative, you're not entitled and you're not deliberately and consciously causing other people pain to get what you want, it can't really be borderline personality disorder. Other people, people I respect, people with way more qualifications and, and research backing them than I have will say that that is wrong. The borderline personality disorder is, is distinct. It's a debate that is, that is ongoing. 
What about the word salad? Word salad is when you just spew a series of words that actually don't really connect to each other within the context of the, of the speaker's own sentence or paragraph, nor do they connect with the question or the conversation that led them to come to that. Where does it come from? It's actually a psychiatric term, and it was used to define the way people uh, who've been diagnosed with schizophrenia would sometimes speak. They would speak sentences and they were clearly trying to express themselves, but the, uh, the, the brain couldn't process and apply a proper syntax. So they're trying to speak and what comes out is just dissociated little clips and bits of phrases about different things and it's just garbage, it doesn't mean anything. In the modern media and in the modern parlance, we've taken that term, which was from psychiatry and, and linguistics uh, within psychiatry, and applied it to what politicians do. So you ask a politician a direct question and they word salad the answer. You get like a sequence of words that is about the subject, that, that, that clearly is uh, around the question that you've asked or is appropriate to that sequence in the conversation, but it really isn't answering anything and it's really not saying anything. What are the two advantages for the covert narcissist for using word salad? Number one, it can make it seem as though you are answering the question whilst you are not. So the flow of any conversation, or indeed interrogation, would be you speak, I speak, you speak, I speak. So you speak, we're in perhaps an argument over something dreadful I've done. You speak, I speak, you speak, I speak, you say something, you ask me a question, perhaps it's something I can't answer, or you make a point that is a, 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 a solid steel point that I can't argue against, but I can't say nothing because of the way language is formed. If you have the last word, you have won. You've made your point and I've conceded a defeat, which whether you're covert or over, if you're in the narcissistic personality cluster, you can't allow that. It's a deeply, deeply um, competitive outlook. In fact, it's so hyper-competitiveness is such a, a key and consistent trait that I've seen when dealing with narcissistic personality disorder, I'm surprised it's not listed as one of the uh, major traits of narcissism. Hyper-competitiveness, meaning they can turn anything into a competition. If you start to raise the issue of empathy with them and say, hey, maybe you could be a little more empathic to how I feel or to how that waiter feels or to how your friends feel when you speak to them like that, because when you're interacting with a narcissist, you won't just see them abusing you, you'll see them abusing other people. What they will do is they'll turn that into a competition over who has more empathy and who's the more empathic person. That can happen, not always, but competition, hyper-competitiveness is brought in. It will be a, oh, so you're putting yourself above me for empathy, well, fuck you, I'm fucking 10 times more empathic than you, buddy. And so, no, I, it's not a contest. I'm just saying, like, maybe if you consider how other people feel when you speak to them, you wouldn't speak to them the way that you talk to them right now. You might be a little more sensitive or a little bit more patient if you had a bit more empathy. Just saying, oh, so you, you're saying you understand more about people and more about how to talk to people than I do, and so on and so forth. It gets turned around. So, the two things that word salad lets them do. It lets them seem like they're answering a question, like they're, they're hitting that beat in the conversation or in the interrogation. We're boxing. You get two digs, we move around a little bit, and then I get three digs, and we move around a little bit, and you get another three digs, and so on and so forth. It's like a back and forth. Um, and it can feel this way. When you're, pro when you're trying to argue with somebody with a narcissistic personality disorder, it can feel like, a, like uh, I can almost hear the, 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 the ping pong. Patink, patonk, patink, patonk, patink, patonk. And, that, and I'm just like, this is ping pong. This is, we're not two adults sincerely discussing an issue, moving towards a solution. So the model in my mind of our adult, adult conversation, as we hold hands, face the problem together and move along our path towards a solution, it's a fucking fantasy inside of my head. In your head, this is a boxing match. In your head, in the person you're doing this with, in the narcissist head, it's a ping pong game. They just have to keep playing it back to you. So that's the first thing it lets them do. The second thing it lets them do is it lets them covertly manipulate your state. And so there's two things, and part two has two subsections to it. So I'm a covert narcissist, and I've been asked a question or put in a position where I really know that I'm in the wrong, but I don't want to admit that I'm wrong. One thing I could do is I could use word salad, which is like a sequence of words. So if you say, did you, um, 
did you uh, hack into my email account and read my emails because I have evidence totally here that you completely did. And I go, well, you know, yes, yes, there are emails and, and people use email to talk to each other all the time. So don't make it about whether I looked at them or you looked at them. I mean, all the people who wrote those emails too, they also looked at them when they opened their email address. Don't tell me you've never opened an email before because I fucking know you have. So don't come at me with this load of bullshit. Sometimes people use letters and they write those letters with parchment and a bit of ink and a quill and they send them by ravens. In, like, in, like in Game of, of, of Thrones, is that what you're saying? Are you saying I'm a white walker from Game of Thrones? That's not an amazing example of word salad. I made it up. Um, <laughs> really? We thought you wrote that beforehand. I made it up off the cuff, but it's, it's, it's kind of addressing what you said, but it's taking it in a different direction. Now, within that, there's two, there's two subsections here. One is I can control your state and generate confusion. And it is confusing. Um, it, it's absolutely, it's confusing. It's a technique that we're trained to use in neuro-linguistic programming and hypnosis to draw the other person into trance. Uh, when you use a sentence that has in neuro-linguistic programming, it's called linguistic ambiguity. So you say a sentence uh, that doesn't really follow its own syntax. And as the person becomes confused, you're doing this for a nice reason. You're doing this to get them to relax to release their phobia of you know, whatever it is or their anxiety about this or that or to make them feel more confident. You're using it for nice reasons. But as you're talking to them and you're using your special hypnotic tone of voice, which is so smooth and calm and relaxing, you'd say something like, I don't know whether it was time for you before to relax and sleep down now, or maybe just later what we could find ourselves doing is going into that state right before sleep where people find they can dream and have everything that they ever desired and what and so on and so forth. There's no, that sentence if you write it out is like what my English teacher would punch me around the back of the head. Like, this doesn't, it doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't make sense. But by using word salad, linguistic ambiguity, I induce a state of, um, in, in the hypnosis way, positive um, confusion which then allows the brain to sort of go into this submissive state of, I don't really know what he's saying, I'll let the embedded commands go in. And the word salad I just gave you, if it made you feel relaxed, it's because if you play it back, I say the word relax, go down, to dream, to sleep. I probably said something about flowing or letting go, I don't know what I said, but that's where the embedded commands go in. I'm not saying everybody with narcissistic personality disorder has a great understanding of NLP, they don't, but they seem to have uh, an understanding of manipulation through language and patterns of behavior that they all share. It's like they all go to the same school or they, or they all go to the same academy. And this is one of them. So word salading induces confusion and helplessness, which makes the other person kind of give up. And it also makes them more open to suggestion. So if you wanted to use this positively, you would use a phrase of, of linguistic ambiguity, and then you would say, and hey, now you can feel good and relax and da -da -da. That's how you'd use it in a therapeutic or a hypnotherapeutic situation. If you're a covert narcissist, you would answer the point that was made to you with something that doesn't go anywhere. So the two things it can do, one is induce confusion and helplessness. The second thing it can do is the covert narcissist can use word salad for blatant provocation of negative states. So they can make you feel, if I just use word salad to whatever question you ask me, eventually you'll feel helpless, annoyed, and you'll be like, fuck it, I just give up. Fine, you win and you'll move on. But I could also use word salad to introduce things that trigger things in you. I could use it to imply that you're, uh, how would I piss somebody off? I guess, um, that you're, that you're just a nasty person, that you're dishonest, that you're immoral, that you're, bleh, I don't know, just think of the horrible things that you could sling at somebody. So I get asked that, you, so let's imagine there's a system here, here's the covert narcissist, here's their strategy, which is the word salad. And here, right here, is the state that they want you to go into. So they are going to choose the state they want you to go into, let's say, uh, rage. Because it's great, if you can get somebody to rage out, well then they lose the argument. If you can provoke somebody to the point where they're so enraged they fling something at you or, or at the wall or they punch something or they turn around and say something dreadful like they call you 
something re like the most horrible thing they can because you wound them up, that's a good that's a good way of winning the argument and having it all closed down. Then all that shame and guilt will be in their state and not in you. So you've won, you've transferred the shame and the guilt. So you can word salad in order to provoke as well. It's a fantastic tool, it's frequently used, watch out for it. I am gonna start talking a little bit more um, about covert narcissism on this channel um, because it's kind of one of those things that I mentioned and then, and then I, I, I let it go and I'm realizing that this is uh, the major threat. Overt narcissism isn't really a major threat. God, God knows an overt narcissist can ruin your day, ruin your life, but at least you can see that shark coming. At least the fin's in the water and the noise is going You get all that when the overt narcissist is, is coming your way. The covert narcissist is much worse because they'll come as a victim, they'll come as a little lost puppy that you just need to take home and fix and everything will be okay. And by doing this, oh, sad puppy, uh, like the cat in um, Puss in Boots, uh, the cat mm, in Shrek, mm -hmm. by doing that, they evoke certain feelings in you that get you to take your armor off, that allow you into the inner sanctum where there's no boundaries. And then once they're in there, they can do the biggest amount of damage. So you actually, even if you have some boundaries, you'll take them down for somebody who's really good at covert narcissism. Final point, one thing to look out for with covert narcissism is um, flip-flopping between two or three personalities. Um, the overt narcissist can afford to be a dick and be a dick all the time. I've known people with overtly narcissistic traits, and I've said this on the channel before, who actually weren't that um, uh, corrupting. I'm not saying you should ever uh, willingly engage in a little bit of contact with an MPD. It's gonna hurt you, that's just what they're gonna do. But if somebody has overtly narcissistic traits and you take them for what they are and you keep them at a distance, it doesn't have to hurt. A covert narcissist, what should you do with a covert narcissist? You won't know until you're in pain. You won't know that you're even in danger until like in June, where you're the good guys from House of Trades, and then House Harkonnen comes up and goes, hey, homie, can I have a hug? And you give them a hug, and then they slip the poison blade in, and you're like, ah, this poison's a bad one, it's worse than the gom jabar, I feel all fiery and agonized, and I'm gonna die soon. And that's when you realize that you're in trouble, because they don't come waving a knife at you, like Sting with ginger hair. What? Sting with ginger hair? Yeah, Sting with ginger hair and going, ah, I'm gonna cut ya, cause I'm, I am i want to cut ya. They don't do that because they're not a character from King Arthur. They'll come up and they'll hug and they will uh, induce a, a receptive state in you first that gets the Holtzman field to turn off. You'll be like, I don't need this, this super futuristic suit of armor anymore, I'm gonna switch it off. I, I switched it off, now let's cuddle. And then at the point of the cuddling, that's when the knife slips in and that's when you realize you're in trouble. So covert narcissism is usually something that is dealt with post hoc. You've gone down the road with them already and you're like, oh fuck, you have stolen both my kidneys. I need them. Then you, you're, you're, already, like, you're already in pain, you're already in trouble, you're already uh, um, on, on, on the wrong foot, knocked off balance and that makes, that makes you vulnerable. So I want you to be aware of these things, but word salad is a very, very common tactic. So please be aware of it, watch out for it. Thanks very much for your time and your attention, and I look forward to speaking to you soon. Cheerio. That's not how I'm gonna start ending videos. Cheerio, that's, that's not a thing. Thank you for your time and your attention, and I look forward to speaking to you soon. That's how we